So I'm going to start my own talk. Um, so you all remember the movie Matrix. And um, if you remember the uh, premise of this movie was that uh, computers are going to exploit humans for, for their metabolic resources, for, for heat. Now this movie gets it completely wrong, and I'll tell you why. This is the real matrix. It's uh, people annotating data sets. And um, th this, is, this is what matrix should have looked like. You know, the computers are exploiting humans to annotate uh, data in, in, in pods. And on the flip side, humans are exploiting computers to generate heat. Um, so there's a company uh, from Ukraine which is selling Bitcoin boxes in, in Siberia as a home heating appliances. So um, you know, this, this is not a joke. You can't, you can't make this up. Hollywood gets it wrong, right? Um, so I think that there are these two gaps between uh, the wet brains and dry brains. I call the first one the data gap, which is that modern machine learning is very training data hungry, requires a lot more data than biological brains. So if, you really if we really understand how biological brains work, we will, get, we will be able to get rid of that matrix. That matrix is not good. Humans should not be in pods. You know, we need to free those humans. So if there's some you know, he, uh, hero or heroine in the audience who are going to free those humans, you'll have to work on biological brains to understand how to annotate less data and you know, um, uh, close the data gap. Uh, there's the energy gap, which I think is also uh, very important. Uh, I understand that 10% of the global electricity consumption right now is being used for uh, computers, data centers, um, and that's growing fast. And we don't want to heat up the environment. So there's a sustainability issue here. Um, and this, I find this very interesting because the current hardware is operating at a, uh, many, many orders of magnitude away from the fundamental limits. And this is the touch point not just between engineering and biology, but also with physics because, the, because there's this fundamental limits. This is going to be touched upon during the um, hardware day. So as you know, the deep ANNs are essentially kind of large data structures is the way I think about them. They just hold the training data, all that labeled uh, data, those, those billions of faces, they are just holding them in some deep net structure. Uh, but biological brains, uh, they learn in some sense in a different way. There's the evolutionary process where the genome is, is mutating and then the brains are being selected. Uh, and we've had millions of generations of vertebrate brains, but in an individual uh, lifetime of a vertebrate brain, there is relatively little learning going on. You can't really teach a chimpanzee to become a human in terms of language learning skills, even though we are extremely closely related genetically. That, that actual brain architecture difference um, gives us the language learning capability and, and doesn't give the chimp the uh, language learning uh, capability. So biological brains come with very strong priors. Um, now, intelligence is a larger topic of which learning is a smaller, I think, subset. So we are focusing here a bit on machine learning rather than machine intelligence per se, uh, just to keep the scope of the course limited. I'm going to talk a little bit about biological learning in the context of a system which I've studied a fair bit, which is songbirds. And I helped uh, produce a little uh, video for TED-Ed for this is for more for children, but I encourage you to, to look it up, how, how birds learn um, how to sing. Now, one interesting kind of dichotomy between uh, the song learning in birds and, and uh, song learning in, 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 and machine learning is the following. In machine learning, if I keep presenting you the same example many times, your accuracy, your performance is going to improve. Uh, and, and this is, uh, you know, you, you recognize this. But the, but the birds behave in the, exactly the opposite way. If you keep presenting the same song many times, its performance actually degrades. And the reason maybe you know, it's getting bored, it's getting rebellious, uh, you, know, you yourself would not be wanting to be presented the same material so many times. So you can see that there's some you know, almost like diametrically opposite behavior between the machine learning and the, and, and the biological learning. And uh, learning almost is not the right way to think about birdsong. I think of it now as development. There is some uh, species genome that, that has in it the potential to develop the birdsong. There is something called an isolate song, where um, the songbirds which learn how to sing, if they never have heard 
any songs. They will actually develop their own songs there in their genome. And if you let them uh, take the isolate birds and breed them over multiple generations, as it turns out, they will evolve song culture. So, so they learn, the uh, uh, son lear learns from the, from the father, et cetera. And what's interesting is that we, one sees evolution of culture, and that culture turns out to be the wild type culture. It's the same culture that you will find in the forest. Uh, so that's very interesting. It says that even that culture is somehow embedded in the, in the species genome. Um, so very, very strong biological priors. And the hypothesis that I have is that the, so we are studying what we call the mesoscale connectivity architecture of brains. I'm going to go into it in a little bit more detail. Um, the hypothesis that I have is that the mesoscale connectivity architecture is the relevant prior structure in, in biological brains that can help understand this data gap, why we don't need so many examples. Um, so you're seeing kind of a mouse brain. There's an injection in the motor cortex. Uh, there's single neurons uh, labeled kind of um, red and purple. And, and the green is kind of a tracer injection that's used to label many neurons together. Um, uh, th there is a particular architecture to how the, how the brain's connected in any given species. Um, on the other hand, if you look at the neural network models, you know, pick your favorite network, they also have some architecture. So not all possible kind of connections are being made in this architecture graph. So humans have handmade that architecture, and of course people uh, have better or worse architectures. So I, I want to put these two things side by side, and what I'm proposing is that if we understand the biological architecture, maybe we can devise better artificial architectures as well. Now, this is not you know, kind of a new thought, um, but it's, it's, it's quite specific as to what aspect of the architecture we need to um, understand. So the current touch points between AI, ML, and neuro either are at the kind of psychology or high-level idea, so people have made these networks, um, and they really should be called artificial neural networks. People call them neural networks, but the neural networks are here. The ones that you code on your computer are artificial ones. They, they differ in important ways. And one touch point is people take psychological concepts like attention. So you've seen attention modules. So yeah, I'd like a show of hands because some of you have already worked in this area. So any of you have used this quote unquote attention networks? Um, yeah, well, there's one person. But, um, or reinforcement learning is you know kind of a high level behavioral idea. Or people take things that are down at the level of the individual neuron also. So the fact that neurons spike, the hardware engineers are trying to make use of that, or synaptic plasticity rules, the fact that the you know, brain's analog and, and noisy. Um, surprisingly to me, you know, the area that I've been focusing on, which is what is the actual circuitry at the level of the whole brain? There has been not a lot of connections uh, made, and partly because we don't really know what that circuit is, and so that, that's the goal. We are trying to map, map that circuit. Um, so let me say a few words about what is, quote unquote, this mesoscopic scale neuroanatomy, and to do that, I want you to think about individual variation in genome sequences, and the remarkable fact that if, if we take two individuals in this room, we take your genomes, and we try to line them up, that we will be able to succeed. And that, that if you think about it, that's really remarkable, because we, you know, look a little bit different each each one of us, we are all recognizably human, uh, but um, there are some differences. If you look at our genomes, they don't differ by a whole lot. So one uh, base pair in a thousand, on an average, uh, will, will differ if you think of these as strings of letters. So you can match them up, and then you know, there are those differences that one can look at. There are also uh, larger scale, scale differences. So brains are very different. If you take two brains, you can't really align them like the way you can align neurons. So this is a sagittal section through a, a mouse brain uh, stained for a myelin, um, which coats some of the axonal fibers. And at this level, you, it is recognizably a mouse brain, and it has got parts, cerebellum, the thalamus, the brainstem, so on and so forth. You, if you start zooming in, you, know, you see individual nuclei. If you zoom in a lot, then you start seeing individual variation. So at some point, you start being a you stop being able to identify it as a mouse, and it becomes an individual mouse. And the idea is that there is some transitional scale where you, where you go from species-specific, species-typical kind of patterns to individual patterns. 
and one would like to map the brain circuits at that kind of mesoscopic scale because that's typical to the species. What is typical to the individual is, of course, programming by the environment, which we can't really, uh, can't really map. Now, um, there is kind of a lot of effort coming from the other end at the very microscopic scale of electron microscopic reconstruction. So papers are now being published on very, very small pieces of uh, vertebrate, uh, of mouse brains in, in, in this case. This is less than a cubic millimeter in size. And um, um, this microscopic level of detail in the circuitry, which with the exception of kind of wiring rules between the neuron, different types of neurons, it varies from individual to in individual, and it contains kind of the programming executed by the environment. So in the very nice example that Chris was putting up where data goes in and, and results go in, um, one might want to modify that a little bit in the context of biology because there's also genetics. Uh, so that, that's one big difference, by the way, between the way kind of current AI ML is working and how biology works. So um, there has been an era of genetic programming which people have kind of forgotten a little bit about and I think there's an opportunity to combine that with this sort of machine learning uh, research. But um, so you have your lifetime programming which is you know, you're interacting with your environment and you're adapting to the environment. That lifetime programming is constrained by this mesoscale architecture which was programmed over the evolutionary time scale which governs the potential connectivity. You might get some actual connectivity in your brain, but there's a potential connectivity. So I've had this kind of motivation for a while, and I, you know, I was doing some of my own digging. You know, 2004, I organized a, a workshop at, at Cold Spring Harbor, um, kind of you know, saying that we need to bring back neuroanatomy. Neuroanatomy sort of was a, a dying or dead subject for, for several decades. It's, it's now come back kind of uh, very vigorously. Um, and this culminated in, a, in sort of a proposal that one should map um, at this mesoscopic scale the uh, brain-wide neuronal connectivity in multiple organisms. And so, you know, I've kind of been doing that in my personal uh, uh, research and, and uh, also participate, uh, participate in community efforts which have been growing, you know, quite strongly. One thing I want to point to is that in AI as well in, in medicine, the primary target is human brains. But if you go to look at biomedical research, it's mostly on mouse brains. So we have gotten very good at you know, curing mouse cancer, you know, curing <laughs> various forms of mouse disease, but one needs to look at the humans. One needs to look at the primates. Uh, it seems obvious, but you know, one, one should say it. The rodent and the primate lineages diverged you know, more than 60 million years ago. So 100 you know, for the mouse, that's tens of millions of generations ago. Um, if you look at uh, uh, the marmoset uh, monkey, which is the one that we are studying in the, in the primate lineage, that diverged 30 million years ago. So fewer generations, in fact, separate us uh, from, the, from the marmosets. And uh, so we have obtained, you know, collaboratively, and, and uh, um, th this is really has been an international collaboration that includes uh, IIT uh, Madras here. The marmoset data was gathered in Japan. Um, uh, we have gathered, uh, for the first time, really, comparative brain-wide data sets of this kind of mesoscale projections done using tracer injections. You see, essentially, a mouse motor cortex injection on the left and a marmoset motor cortex injection on the, on, on the right. This is a so-called anterograde tracer, which traces out the outputs of a given kind of uh, node in the brain. Um, you can see the um, corpus callosum that's connecting to the other side, and you can see the spinal um, tract that's going down to the spinal cord. Uh, this is a um, retrograde injection uh, also in the mouse and the uh, marmoset uh, motor cortices. Um, this maps the inputs into a given brain region. So by injecting these tracers systematically, uh, you know, at different points in the brain and combining the results is how we hope to understand the mesoscale architecture. So that's kind of the research program. It's taking a long time to gather this data set. These are, these are not easy experiments to do, but this is ground truth data. So if you look at fMRI, if you look at resting state, if you look at diffusion, it's very indirect, it's not ground truth. One has to have ground truth data. One thing I have learned personally as a physicist 
working in biology is not to waste time on noisy or you know, unsure or uncertain data because biology is very diverse, very, um, uh, a lot of complicated details. One really wants kind of high quality ground truth data sets to look at. It's one reason I, I really like neuroanatomy as a, as a subject. Um, so we are doing these kind of, you know, so there's a little cartoon here that shows here's a node. Uh, by anterograde traces, you map the outputs from that node, and retrograde traces, you map the inputs to this node. Now, this is a very, very, very crude cartoon. And then one creates a grid of injections um, across the brain. Um, one kind of element that I want to point to is technical, which is how we cut the brains, stain them, and image them, is using this so-called tape transfer method. We cut the brain to very thin sections, so um, you know, a tenth of the thickness of the human hair. Um, or even thinner. And so at that point, you're dealing with a very fragile piece of tissue. Um, uh, we do that by using this piece of essentially adhesive tape that is stuck on uh, to, a, to a block, and then one sections uh, this block. This worked for mouse, this works for marmoset, and it actually works for humans. And that's kind of the technique we are also going to use here to, uh, to section. Now, one benefit of taking these physical sections is one can use the classical histochemical uh, histo, um, immunohistochemical uh, methods. If you take whole brains, you can also make them transparent, and you, one can do histochemistry by immersing those brains in reagents. But by the time you've gotten up to the size of a human brain, it's a very large brain. Uh, diffusion is very slow. Um, so you still have to cut the human brain up into uh, sections anyway. So I, I, I kind of prefer this physical um, sectioning method, and thanks to the tape, we are able to reassemble all of those sections into a 3D data structure, so it doesn't really hurt us. I would point out that electron microscopy kind of works in the same way by taking these physical um, sections. Um, to do this, one is to combine the computational element. You know, there's a computational workflow together with the um, biological workflow. Um, I'm not going to go over, uh, through it in detail. The, the Marmoset pipeline we published this year um, in eLife, and as you can see, um, this uh, collaboration included colleagues from uh, Marcelo Rosa from Australia and, and uh, uh, colleagues from Japan uh, who you know, kindly invited me to um, set up a Marmoset lab uh, in Ricken. I have subsequently actually now moved this lab to the, to the US to, uh, to Pittsburgh with a uh, colleague, uh, Peter Strick, who will also be participating in our um, uh, human, proposed human brain um, uh, project. So this pipeline is published. If you want, you can take a look at it. And what we are now doing is the data set that we have gathered from this pipeline, we are starting to publish results uh, from that. Um, I'll, uh, so these are papers, I'll, I'll give a couple examples. Um, I, I kind of like this one because it's relevant for uh, machine learning architectures. Um, uh, monosynaptic connection from your primary auditory cortex going to the primary visual cortex. So supposing you're building a, a, a network to process video. Um, and you're processing the audio stream and the video stream separately. Um, so people thought about such parallel post-processing streams in brains as well, but I think what people have realized, and you know, this, this is an example in, in the marmoset brain, that sensory fusion occurs at an earlier stage rather than extracting high-level details. So the primary auditory cortex, primary visual cortex, in fact, there's a connection from the primary auditory cortex going to the primary visual cortex in the marmoset, and every reason to believe that we, you know, we, we might have such a connection uh, as well. And so this is something that we you know, really learned by looking at the anatomical uh, projections. Uh, another example, this is more technical and, and detailed. I'm not going to go into it, but for the specialists in the audience who study vision. Um, uh, so neuroanatomists have drawn these boundaries in the map. So there's a structure called the lateral geniculate nucleus. So some of you may have seen that when looking at um, you know, people motivate the deep networks by saying there's the retina, there's the LGN, there's V1. They never talk to you about the pulvinar nucleus, uh, which you should also learn about. Maybe we will hear a little bit about it, which is another nucleus. It turns out that parts of the pulvinar are receiving exactly the same inputs as parts of the LGN and are projecting in the exactly the same ways to the, uh, to the primary visual cortices. So even at these sort of textbook cartoon levels, um, there are things that may not be quite right in the current neuroanatomical textbooks. Um, and, and once one understands those patterns, one may start building them into the, uh, the vision architectures that, uh, that, that one is building. So 
uh, give you a quick example of a comparative. So, so the, what I'm trying to capitalize on is the comparative analysis between the mouse and the marmoset. So these data sets on their own are difficult to analyze because you don't really know what you're looking for. But if you're looking for differences, then that's a little easier to see. So we are currently doing analysis of um, motor cortical projections from the mouse and the marmoset, and um, uh, this is ongoing work. We are hoping to send it off uh, soon for uh, publications. You can see uh, uh, my collaborators here are, are, are labeled, um, and a small team of annotators in the uh, Center for Computational Brain Research uh, um, are, you know, in the local matrix of uh, creating label data sets so we can train our artificial networks to segment these, uh, segment these uh, real neural networks. Uh, one thing I will say is that um, such comparative work, as we start doing it, is a lot behind compared with, uh, let's say, comparative genomics. So if you take the mouse atlas textbook, um, there's a, a Allen Institute uses uh, this mouse atlas. This comes from uh, Larry Swanson um, and uh, Hongwei Dong. Uh, and I'm not going to show you the atlas. This tree here is sort of a overall pattern of how the hierarchical regions in the uh, hier hierarchical grouping of regions in the brain. And below, I show the uh, sort of the marmos corresponding marmoset brain hierarchy from. Uh, Paxinos uh, and, and uh, Hasekawa Atlas. Now, I'm not showing any, you any details, but just look that these trees are different. Now, it cannot be that the mouse and marmoset brains are so different. These are just different views two different neuroanatomists have taken of the vertebrate brain. And um, if you look at the high-level uh, kind of nodes in the hierarchy, you can kind of see this. Now, this poses a challenge, because how are we going to compare the connectivity if we can't even compare the, uh, the brain regions and, and, and hierarchy. So we sort of sat down and we tried to reconcile the individual regions that are constituting this hierarchical atlas. I'm not going to go in detail uh, uh, into this, but we were able to reconcile about 80% of the structures. Of course, you don't expect every structure to match because, the, for example, the lateral geniculate nucleus in the primate has a lot of internal structure that's not present in, in, the, in, in the mouse, um, uh, but um, we are able to achieve some matches. Um, this is just a picture of the mouse brain and the marmoset brain, so the mouse brain is about half a cc and the marmoset brain is about 10 cc's. Um, uh, and if you look at individual brain compartments, they, they, they differ to some extent. One thing that I want to uh, just focus in on is two structures called the thalamus and the chordoputamen. Um, and the ratios of volumes in the mouse and the marmoset are roughly the same between the thalamus and the chordoputamen. And the marmoset has uh, a, a little bit more thalamus compared with the chordo, uh, chordoputamen. Um, uh, and I, I tell you that because it'll come up in a minute. So here's the mouse kind of motor cortices, primary and secondary motor cortices. These were defined originally by, if you stimulate in the motor, primary motor cortex, you can elicit movement. Um, a rather crude uh, definition. Uh, but one thing that you can see, um, and also the primary motor cortex sends projections down to the spinal cord, although other, you know, there are other regions in the brain that also send such uh, projections. You can see that in the mouse, um, in the marmoset, there are more areas, kind of more differentiation, uh, more specialization, um, even at the level of these anatomical atlases. Um, if one does kind of um, stim if one does electrical stimulation-based, quote-unquote, mapping, people draw these nice-looking homunculi. This is a mouse homunculus. Uh, it, it, it's, it, this is really an artist's rendition. It, it doesn't you know, have that specificity. But uh, there is some kind of stereotypical um, uh, pattern where the hind limb kind of portion of the motor cortex is more caudal and the uh, face Vibrissa is more rostral in the mouse, but there is significant individual variation also. So it's not like every mouse is going to be the same. This is for the marmoset. Similarly, you find the hind limb more sort of ro uh, r more towards the tail and towards the midline, whereas the face regions are, are, are a little bit more front and lateral. But again, there's significant um, individual um, variation. 
So here's just one finding I'm going to share with you. This is still very preliminary work, but it was so striking that even, you know, uh, even if we have small changes, this finding will probably not, not change, which is both for the primary and for the secondary motor cortices, we found that the thalamic projection is stronger comparatively in the marmoset than in the mouse. The mouse seems to have more strong projection from the basal ganglia, um, uh, to the basal ganglia from the, from the motor cortex, both primary and secondary. Uh, what could be the meaning of that? Well, you know, in some sense, the basal ganglia are associated with somewhat more automated programmatic movements, and the corticothalamic loops are maybe somewhat more flexible movements. So, you know, one can make up an ethological story uh, that could go along with this. Um, but um, this was interesting for me because I've asked many neuroanatomists, uh, do you know about this? You know, because we are afraid we've made a mistake. Um, and also, if it is true, then what does it mean? Um, and I've you know, pretty much drawn re a relative blank. Um, so we may be at a very large level still learning new things about the comparative architectures of these, of these uh, brains. So I'm not going to go into that into more detail. But we are sort of carrying out this program. So there are, and this is done collaboratively with individual neuroanatomists who are experts in particular brain regions. This is a region called the frontal eye fields, um, uh, uh, retrogradely labeled by injections in a part of the brain called the superior colliculus. Um, and this collaboration with Tadashi Isa in Japan. And one interesting thing we found is that the frontal eye fields are supposed to be uh, on the top of the brain, on the dorsal surface of the brain. Uh, but we found retrogradely labeled neurons lay, you know, all the way ventral in the, in, the marmoset, uh, in the marmoset brain. So some surprises there. Um, this region, um, again, we are going to do a comparative analysis, mouse versus uh, marmoset, uh, is being done with uh, Angela Roberts, uh, who helped place these um, injections. And um, uh, some of these injections are in regions where humans are being stimulated with deep brain stimulation uh, for treating depression. And um, the reason I think that you know, ground truth data is really necessary is that those uh, localizations are being done based on what's known from MRI, fMRI. In the human, of course, for, for reasons that uh, are you know, a little bit technical, we cannot do this kind of, I cannot inject a human and take the brain out. We have to use other methods. So you don't know the ground truth, but humans are being you know, surgically operated upon, needles being placed based on this very indirect kind of notion we have of how the human brain is connected. Um, going to uh, talk a little bit about transsynaptic uh, rabies-based mapping of motor circuitry. So this is a um, rat that was injected in its uh, forepaw uh, with the uh, rabies virus. And this is live rabies virus, and it crosses synapses. And in this case, it has crossed seven synapses. So according to the seven degrees uh, seven degrees of separation theory of the brain, by this time every neuron in the brain should be labeled. Uh, but it's not. It turns out that the label is extremely sparse, which um, you know, points to a more, uh, a picture of the brain that's not kind of small world all to all connected, but relatively parallel channels. We don't really know if that's, you know, I mean, these are not completely parallel, obviously, your, your brain is connected. Uh, but so these are sparsely labeled neurons in the thalamus, in the brainstem, sorry, sorry, uh, in the cerebellum, in the brainstem, in the thalamus, and, and all the way up to the cortex, we found that with this kind of rabies injection in, in the forepaw, one could kind of map out at the same time the whole motor circuit. This is Peter's uh, kind of uh, research program that one, one can map out transsynaptically the whole, whole motor circuit. And um, now, of course, you know, I, I don't want to overemphasize this, but um, you know, if somebody gets bitten uh, and, and gets a rabies infection, they would essentially get rabies infected neurons in their brains, which we could then, then look at. So I, I'm just gonna uh, leave it at that. So as you heard from Bhaskar, uh, uh, we have uh, just received word that uh, uh, we may be um, funded for a, uh, um, uh, a human brain project. So let me tell you about work that I've already been doing, and then I'll tell you about what we are planning to do there. Um, so I have always been wanting to do human because mice are, you know, lovely, um, very interesting. Um, but we we want to study humans. And um, remember the tape transfer method. 
So this is um, a small piece of human tissue cut on the same cryostat that we cut mouse with. Uh, this is a cross-section of a hemisphere of a human brain, and this is a large block uh, being cut in a, a, a large a whole body uh, cryostat. We can use the same method um, and, and produce essentially high quality, this is a human brain section which we have cut in my, cut in my lab. Um, you can see there's a lot more you know, cortex, of course, folded and so on and so forth. Um, and, and the quality uh, is pretty good. We can 3D reconstruct it. This is a piece of spinal cord that was sitting in somebody's lab for, for a decade. So you know, even uh, old tissue could be processed. Uh, this is zoom in. Um, you, can, uh, uh, you, you can see the cellular uh, morphology, and we can you know, do this uh, essentially high throughput. Um, now, this kind of post-mortem study um, allows us to also correlate with the MRI. Um, so this is a study that um, I did with colleague uh, uh, Larry Latour, who I've been friends with uh, since graduate school. He's at the NIH, NINDS. Um, uh, here's a, a brain of a, a patient who suffered from traumatic uh, injury. So um, one of the hypotheses in that field was that the traumatic injury causes axonal damage. It tears the, tears the nerves. Uh, what uh, Larry suspected and his colleagues suspected and was, we were able to show by doing the postmortem histology that in fact it's not so much the neurons that are axons that are torn, it's the blood vessels that are torn and there are micro bleeds. So by doing an iron stain, we were able to see the, uh, the, blood, uh, you know, the blood corpuscles and the myelin stain shows that the, um, you know, at least the myelinated axons are relatively intact still in that part of the brain. So it could help kind of address this sort of hypothesis that's uh, relevant for traumatic brain injury. And people are using you know, these hypotheses to develop therapies in the past. If, if you believe that axons are being damaged, you'll make a drug that you know, tries to treat the axons. If you believe that it's a bleed, then you might do different therapies. So I think there's a lot of opportunity uh, for post-mortem uh, human brain um, analysis, but um, so I'm really excited that uh, we have this opportunity. So uh, Mohan and I have been talking about this for, for years. So we uh, finally decided to take the plunge. And uh, <laughs> we, we are going to try to do with human brains what we've been doing with mouse brains and marmoset monkey brains. Uh, and, and specifically try to develop a high throughput. And high throughput is very important. If I study one brain in one year, uh, it's going to be a very slow rate of progress. I can't really scale up. I need to do one brain in you know, half, a, half a month, you know, one month in, in, in one apparatus. Um, and it boils down to kind of um, data rates and data volumes in the microscopy. So the, uh, the data acquisition and processing hardware that we need is in the gigabits per second range. So uh, we... Uh, chatted with Bhaskar and he said, well, this is what the 5G networks, you know, these are, these are the boards being built for the 5G network. So perhaps we can synergize these engineering efforts. Um, another thing that um, uh, sort of Anand is uh, uh, really going to be helpful here is um, we need uh, to process the data. One human brain at light microscope is petabyte. Um, uh, so there's two things to be said about that. One is in 1990, when the decade of the brain began, one petabyte of data cost the entire NIH budget to store. So today, it's pocket change. We just bought a petabyte of data in, in my lab. So there's been this large, you know, that's 30 years, but you know, th th there's been this ability to store the data. The reason neuroanatomy died as a subject is you couldn't even acquire and store the data. People were looking at it. Uh, so now we can store it. But a petabyte of data is still fairly significant. So if, I, if I'm generating a petabyte every you know, couple times a month and you want to, you need to process it like close to the thing. So you know, these are good engineering challenges. But um, I think that uh, um, uh, those engineering challenges can be overcome. You know, otherwise, we wouldn't have written, written this uh, proposal. There are already existing commercial devices, but you know, one can, if one wants to scale at lower, uh, lower cost. Um, so those of you in the audience who are interested perhaps in even joining forces, you know, please talk to us. Um, and uh, just the state of the art. So as Chris was saying, you know, one shouldn't do this, you know, kind of 
second best. One, one really wants to do this, produce the best data set that, that exists. So in the sense of spatial resolution, if you take that as a metric, um, the current quote-unquote human brain atlas is using a very simple stain called Nissel, uh, and this is also inspiring for some of you in the audience. Franz Nissel was a 24-year-old graduate student more than 100 years ago when he discovered that this uh, crescent violet or thymin produced very good you know, interpretable stains of the brain. 130 years later, we are still using it because it's very cheap. Um, you know, you can do universal chemistry, it's quite expensive. If you do molecular biology, it's even more expensive. If I'm going to do it really scale, you know, I, we will also need fairly cheap chemistry as well. Um, but, okay, nissel stained brains, uh, if you look at the current kind of brain volumes that are available today, uh, we will definitely be, you know, order of magnitude, orders of magnitude may be better than that, and we hope to do it rapidly. So that, that's kind of the ambition. Now, I'm don't want to oversell this at the moment because this is going to be a very difficult lift. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't take it on. I've just spoken about the um, uh, analytics and uh, processing challenges, but you know, just to give you an example, Anand estimated just to rotate one section, one brain section, on uh, 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 you know quad core 86 CPU is going to take 40 minutes. Now that's going to be a big problem because my whole human brain is going to be 20,000 sections. So we better speed this up. So we, it can be done, you know, it, it's not a, uh, so we obviously looked into all of this. Um, let me spend a little bit of time talking about the computational aspects of this um, kind of work. So I'm going to stop talking about the human brain uh, mapping. But um, <clears throat> what's also interesting in, in anatomy is that tools which were not being used in neuroscience before, so neuroscience, largely has used signal processing tools because we get electrical signals, behavioral signals. Now we are needing tools from geometry and topology. Uh, definitely machine learning, you know, we are, we are needing everywhere, but we are needing geometrical and topological tools because the data is of a geometrical and topological um, nature and that's kind of a nice opportunity. So geometry because we deform the, the spaces to match sections together to go from 2D to 3D or to take an atlas and morph it so we are able to successfully do it, um, and this data is, is uh, up on the, on the web. Um, uh, this is a, um, I call it solving the where problem. Uh, where are you in the brain? You do it by mapping atlases. Um, and uh, not going to go into the technical details, but for example, going from 2D to 3D, dealing with multiple contrast mechanisms, shape variability, presence of uh, you know, data with damage in it or, or even like stains in it that don't match your reference brain. We are able to deal with all of this um, computationally. Um, but it is done at, a, I think, a algorithmically robust way using differential geometry and uh, EM-based uh, 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 methodology. Um, um, so not going to go into technical details, but um, simply saying that this is a solved problem more or less. Um, and one interesting thing that we've done after having done this on hundreds of brains is uh, ask the question how the individual variations are. So we took for this particular study uh, over 100 uh, uh, brains, mouse brains, which are, you know, C57 black 6, male, particular age. So um, it should be as controlled as possible. And then looked at how they were varying and here on the bottom panel, uh, what you see is um, the patterns of covariation, and, and what we found is that the cortex, the cerebellar and thalamic structures were positively correlated with each other in their you know, kind of um, scale variation. The scale variations are um, at, the, you know, at the level of a, you know, a few percent, uh, so not large scale variations. Um, but, but there were some, you know, typical patterns that, uh, that we were able to find. Um, so, um, you know, doing this kind of quantitative geometrical analysis, we are able to study individual uh, variation uh, across um, several brains. Uh, now, humans are going to be a lot more complicated. Marmosets are already more complicated, but, you know, we have tools to, 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 to address them. 
um, we are skeletonizing and, and also detecting individual neurons using um, kind of topological methods. This is also a paper that we are preparing for publication. Um, and uh, perhaps I will not go into a, a, a lot of detail here, but here's kind of the rough story. Neurons are like trees. Um, so what you're seeing here is a, uh, uh, a tracer injection in the motor cortex, but also two individual neurons that are uh, reconstructed. Uh, these are from the uh, Genelia uh, mouse-like project. And these tracer-injected uh, green volumes, you can think of them as thousands of labeled individual neurons like that, which show some individual variation. People have thought of this kind of data in terms of connectivity matrices. So what we are doing is saying that, no, let's not think of connectivity matrices because that's ignoring the tree structure, which has got this kind of branching pattern, which may be important for, for brain uh, uh, you know, architecture. It may be that one shouldn't think about graphs. Maybe one should think about collections of trees that are touching each other. We don't really know what the importance of that is computationally, but it is certainly true that it is a feature of the brains. It is not a feature of the artificial neural networks that we are constructing. So we are trying to respect this tree structure. And from the tracer injection, we are trying to extract the tree structure. Uh, in order to do that, we applied a topological method called Morse theory. Now, I don't know if any of you have encountered Morse theory. When I, when I was you know, kind of growing up and trying to do my undergraduate work, I thought this stuff was totally esoteric mathematics. I would never touch it, so I didn't bother to learn it. It was a mistake. You know, <laughs> one of my regrets is that there were these fairly abstract mathematical concepts which I ignored, you know, like not practical. But it, you know, they, these turned out to be quite practical. Uh, you know, Hardy famously said about number theory, right? Some journalists asked him whether it's going to be useful. He said, I hope not. Um, <laughs> he was completely wrong. You know, cryptography uh, turned out. So one, you know, word of advice <laughs> for th those of you who are learning, don't make my same mistake. Learn the fundamentals really well, you know, math, physics, you know, whatever it is, the fundamental aspects, um, because you don't know where they will become useful um, at the end. Anyway, so we're using something called Morse theory, and we're using it to skeletonize our tracer injections. Um, this is thanks to computational techniques that have been developed by computer scientists who've, who've taken this up and done uh, topological data analysis, made it into you know, packages that we can now throw at data. There are still scaling challenges. These are not linear algorithms, so that poses the superlinear algorithm. So making them linear or sublinear really important. Um, we are skeletonizing individual neurons and, and trees. Um, I'm just going to give you a little feel for what Morse theory does in this context. Here's a, 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 a little neural fragment that is showing up in a 2D image. You can see that here it is kind of faint, but you can still see it. If I think of this as a topography, it looks like this. So basically there's sort of a mountainous, there's mountain ridges. And there is something called a one stable manifold that one extracts from Morse theory, which um, connects the peaks to the um, uh, saddles and then again to the peaks. So if you track the mountain ridges, then one can extract this continuous structure. So that's the basic idea. And there's another basic idea, which is called persistent simplification. So because of noise, there's going to be a lot of spurious peaks and valleys. So one gets rid of those by using something called topological persistence. So we are doing that, and uh, here, here's the example of reconstructing um, single neurons. So we are now getting these data sets where, with mouse brain at least, we are getting many single neurons labeled. And the state of the art is people sitting, you know, it is, it is the matrix, people sitting, and in a video game-like manner with virtual reality trying to trace the neurons. This is not scalable, you know, but this is what's happening in the top research lab. So, okay, our precision and recall using the Morse method is better than the best in class method that we had. Not quite as good as we need it to be, still human intervention needed. One lesson also is that human intervention is not going to go away. So the way one should think about machine learning, at least in the applications that I'm dealing with, is not full automation, it's not going to happen. But take seriously the human-machine interaction and how you can make a better tool, right? So yes, there may be self-driven cars someday, but for now, or self-driven for forklifts, or self-driven something that makes buildings. But for now, let's focus on the human-machine interface, and that design challenge is is what you know one really needs to. Um, uh, 
So this is a tracer injection skeletonized using MORS. Um, I think I'm going to skip this. Um, we are also doing just um, a semantic segmentation of the neuroanatomical data. So you see by eye, here's a soma, here's an axon, here's a dendrite. Can you teach an algorithm to do it? And you know, deep nets to the rescue. Um, we, um, uh, so this is what, what I mean. So you look at an image and you say, this is the body of the neuron, the soma. Uh, these are the uh, dendrites. Here are some axons that are fasciculated, which may need to be treated differently than axons which are not fasciculated. And there are, you know, maybe boutons can be detected. So we made kind of a um, hierarchical categorization. And then we are training networks. So now I began this talk by saying that the deep nets are lacking prior structure. So this is something that we are trying to address. So an idea that we had, and also other people are pursuing similar ideas, is can one use topological structure as prior? And we did something, this is uh, actually Shomik's uh, idea, uh, uh, just uh, marry the two at the hip. So take a deep net, take the discrete Morse output, just join them together, add another deep net. This is one of the interesting things in this field is people don't understand these networks. You can use them as if they were black boxes. We'll have to get out of this. You know, I think that this is not stable. We need to understand. But OK, so we can do something. So these, these were kind of the best in class. There was something called a UNet. This is an encoder-decoder architecture. Um, not going to go into it, it in detail. There was something then called ALBU, which is UNets, but with a little bit of boosting added to it, taking several UNets and training one on the data sets that the other one failed on. Um, and so this, we took this ALBU architecture, and then we made a uh, junction with the discrete Morse. And here's the results. Um, okay, so the ALBU is already pretty good. Um, uh, but one thing is that once you start employing armies of annotators, you realize a few percentage points in the <laughs> performance. <laughs> well, you know, at that point, you're talking about two competitors. The one which has got the better algorithm is, I'm sorry to say, will win. So those few percentage point differences do make a, do make a difference. Um, we found something interesting that when the humans, oh, so the, what the topological algorithm did for us is the ALBU found us disconnected pieces, but the topological algorithm you know, kind of found these connected pieces. So the prior was active, you could see. Um, and uh, what we then found to our surprise what, was that the humans were not very good. Uh, they had missed some things, which the algorithm found. Uh, and then when we updated the annotations, uh, that's what produced this imp improved uh, performance 